Support for the program Humanize Newcomers was provided in part by Rose Community Foundation and viewers like you. I'm Sarah Kurz. I'm the Chief Impact Officer at Rose Community Foundation. I grew up in Park Hill um, in the you know early and mid 90s and it was a very different place than it is now um, but my dad's still in the home I grew up in and um, still feels very familiar in a lot of ways. Denver's just so much larger than it used to be. Um, I never felt like it was a cow town, but it was definitely not the booming place it is now. My parents, not from Colorado, most people my age, their parents are not from Colorado, um, and they intentionally moved to what was the first integrated neighborhood in Denver, which is Park Hill, um, because they wanted us to have um, that diversity in, in our community. And so that was always a big part of my life in Park Hill. Um, even though Park Hill itself was pretty segregated, north side and south side, um, I was fortunate to always go to schools that, that had a lot of diversity. I've always worked, I've been really fortunate to have all of my jobs be focused on somehow sort of bettering the Denver or the Colorado community. Um, and that's where I've found meaning throughout my career. And I'm really lucky to get to do work that I believe in that I think helps our community be stronger. Rose Community Foundation comes from Rose Hospital. So Rose Hospital was built in the 1940s by Denver's Jewish community, who rallied together and built the hospital with resources of their own as a place where Jewish doctors could practice freely when they were being discriminated against and not being given privileges at other hospitals. It was also the first hospital in Colorado to give privileges to a black doctor, and that value for diversity was something that continued through the hospital all the way until the 90s when it was sold to a corporation and the proceeds from that hospital created Rose Community Foundation. So we as a foundation have always had that value for diversity and inclusion and also the Jewish values. Um, the Jewish identity in America is one of of people who've always been displaced from their homes over and over again. Um, and so we've always had a commitment to immigrants and refugees because of our own origin story. When we first started doing the Newcomers Fund work, one of the donor advised fund holders at Rose Community Foundation sent me an email and said, my parents were welcomed here in the 1940s when it was not safe for them to be in Europe. And that's why I care so much about making sure that today's newcomers continue to be welcomed by Denver and by America. Everyone I grew up with, our parents were not from Colorado. We were all a generation of new people in Denver. And that was our identity, was that we lived in a city where our parents and our grandparents didn't grow up, but we did. And just that value for whoever, wherever you come from, that you're a part of this community. It's not a state that puts a lot of capital on your longevity and your many generations here. Because so many of us are newcomers ourselves, it's just a very welcoming place to the outsider. And I think that we need to continue doing that, sort of regardless of where someone's from. We're a community foundation. And part of the community is the diversity and the fact that we're always welcoming newcomers from all over the country, but also from all over the world. And so continuing to make sure that our community is as welcoming today as it was when my parents arrived here or when people my age arrived here is a really core part of what we do. I think, unfortunately, there's an idea among some that people who are arriving here now are looking for handouts. When somebody leaves their home and travels through the jungle and all sorts of terrible conditions to cross the Darien Gap, with their young children, they are here to make a life for themselves. They're not here because they think there's gonna be a temporary handout. 
they believe that this is going to be a better place for them and their children and they want to work and they want to be self-sufficient and have all the opportunities to succeed. They're not here for just a day of a free meal. We know that Denver has grown enormously in the last five years, in the last 20 years. And this is just the latest wave of people coming to Denver to make their home here. And just like every other person that Denver has welcomed over the years, I hope that this new population just finds a sense of belonging here and that they're not treated as migrants or immigrants, they're just part of our community. I mean, it's easy to hear numbers, like 40,000 people have come through Denver and forget that each of those thousands of people is a human being with their own story. Um, and talking to a mother who, whose kid couldn't get an education in Venezuela, and they've been here long enough and settled here, and now their child is enrolled in a public school and coming home and saying, look what I learned today. And that made this very long, arduous journey of theirs worthwhile because now their kid has that opportunity to get an education. And so just thinking about what each individual is here to hope to achieve for their family and their kids helps me remember every day that it's way more than just a large number of people, but made up of individuals. We're fortunate to have so much, right? We have a roof over our heads, we have an education, we have uh, the ability to navigate our community in our native language and have the resources we need to feed ourselves and do extracurricular activities and go on vacations. Um, and so it's almost unimaginable to, to for my children to think about what it would be like to be in a home where they didn't necessarily know where the next meal was coming from or have a safe place to sleep. And so I don't think with kids, the point is to try to get them to actually envision that because it's so foreign, but just to think about the person that they're seeing as a human being who has the same wants and needs and silly sense of humor and all the same things that they do. Um, instead of just seeing them as sort of other. The Biden administration made it possible for Venezuelan immigrants to get work permits. And the demand for those work permits has been out of, out of anything we expected. And so thousands of people are getting those work permits because they wanna work and they wanna be contributing members of our society. And it can be very compelling for people who may not come from a place of just compassion for this population, just to realize that these are workers in our community. We have a really successful economy in Denver, and now we have new people who want to go to work in our industries. And so that alone can be a compelling case to make for, for why we should care about this new population. When I hear the rhetoric that, that can exist on the national level in debating immigration policy, it's very comforting to me to go back to the idea that more than 5,000 people in our community contributed to the Newcomers Fund at Rose Community Foundation and new contributions still come in every day. I think the easiest thing that we can all do to help make our community feel as welcoming to the newcomers as it, as it was to us is just to recognize people's humanity and not see it as 40,000 migrants coming into our community, but just a person in front of you. Um, whether that's a new kid in your child's classroom or a person that you're interacting with as you go about your life, just to see them as a person and an individual and not one of 40,000 migrants. People want to be a welcoming place. and They want to help this new population. And that's so rewarding to me when there might be dialogue out there that makes it seem like a contentious debate to see that for so many people in our community, it's just a no-brainer. My name is Abe Layden. Uh, I'm a fifth-generation Coloradan, uh, born in Denver. I'm uh, the first county commissioner uh, that has Latino heritage and is also part of the LGBTQ community. My dad was a miner and a journeyman electrician, so he worked on the Johnson uh, Tunnel, the Eisenhower Tunnel component, um, back when I was a little boy. So we lived in Idaho Springs in Georgetown uh, for a long time in a really middle-class, uh, kind of normal family and my parents couldn't afford to send me to college, but they always believed in me. Uh, so I just, you know, my focus was working as hard as I could in high school. Thankfully, Colorado State University gave me a full ride, uh, academic scholarship, and that made sense. 
uh, for a family that couldn't afford it. So I really have a, a huge debt to um, the public education system, to Colorado State University, and um, they really launched my future. Begin with compassion. Be begin with the humanity. And again, you know, being a fifth generation Coloradan and a person of color, I deeply care about the plight of those that are seeking refuge and seeking asylum in our country. What they are fleeing is horrific. The counterbalance is the practical realities of limited resources. And we heard in many respects that, you know, recreation was being cut and public safety and, you know, basic DMV services in order to accommodate those that were coming. Um, I don't fault the, the immigrants. My, my thesis in undergrad was the economic impact of Mexican immigration on the politics of Southern California. And I went to Mexico and interviewed and worked with people that were facing a really significant situation. I get it. Um, the challenge is how do we make the space in the room so that this is not disenfranchising everybody that's already here. I think work authorization, you know, where there's, you know, demand and supply, uh, I think those metrics are always going to be significant and there is frankly a significant demand for, for workers uh, within Denver and the state of Colorado and I think one of the best forms of welfare is a job. Um, when you have that opportunity towards self-sufficiency, you can become self-reliant and care for your family and future generations of your family. So, you know, we've had really good conversations with Mayor Johnston around work authorization and we need to put more pressure on Congress to make that happen. So I do prioritize those who are legally here first and that may be a difference of philosophy, but um, for us again, you know, one of the, the big challenges is when you put a sign on your state or your city saying we are a sanctuary, it's only natural to think that that will be a beacon, that will be a welcome sign to our area. So I think it was a mistake to say uh, we're a cold weather climate, we don't have a plan, come here for two weeks and then you're out on the streets. I don't think that's compassionate. If we had uh, unlimited resources and a plan and we were a little bit kinder to folks during the cold, colder months than, than perhaps, but we're not, and we saw a lot of people um, on the streets during this crisis. So what I would say is, when 40,000 new people come to the Denver metro area at a cost of what was at the beginning $180 million, as elected officials, we have to prioritize. And so it's a struggle. So I'm the founder and chair of the Douglas County Homeless Initiative. We're one of only two counties that has reduced overall homelessness um, in the state of Colorado. We were dealing with a point in time count in Denver of 5,000 homeless um, that were not manageable, that were really struggling from a public health standpoint and we were seeing encampments everywhere, businesses starting to flee. It was affecting the economy and the, the quality of life for citizens. 5,000 versus 40,000. And I realize in many respects, some of those 40,000 have gone to other places and there have been services. I really applaud the mayor and Denver for, for the bipartisan work that I think we've all done. Uh, on work authorizations and some of the transportation measures, but um, I think we need to be intellectually honest about the number 40,000 and 180 million dollars. And I think that's been ratcheted down quite a bit to maybe 80 or 90 million, but it's still quite a bit. So um, ongoing conversation, but I think that's how we, we talk about that in a humane way. Let's remain compassionate, but let's not have a welcome sign to a place that um, is cold and not have a plan. One of the biggest challenges we have at the state level and nationally is how toxic and fringe the extremes have become. And there's this massive silent majority of individuals that are like you and I. They're humanists, they care about people. Um, I was a private practice commercial real estate attorney for most of my career. Um, I don't need to be in public service. I'm doing this because I care. I care about my three kids. I care about my community. I wanna make a difference where I live. I wanna be that bridge between people groups because I represent both Caucasian and people of color. I wanna be that bridge between the conservative Christians and the LGBTQ community because I am both. Um, I am a person of faith. I think I'm in this role for for some sort of reason, um, but the, the work that we've done to reduce homelessness and reduce crime and you know create that quality of life that's so important in Douglas County, that is my focus. So I think what might be misunderstood is people thinking that I'm, I'm in it for, for me. This, this isn't about me. 
um, and I don't need to, to have any more titles or any more recognition. I'm here to serve, and, and that's it. I grew up a Democrat in Boulder County, and here I am a Republican in Douglas County. I really see both sides. In Colorado, the number one party is independent. I mean, there are far more independents here. And for those of us natives, we know that this has always been a very purple state. Um, for me, I really do care a lot about public safety. Um, I care a lot about our military. I care a lot about the faith-based community. Um, and I care about keeping your taxes low, you know? And that's, those are things that may not resonate and didn't resonate with me as much when I was a, a kid. But when the government reaches, reaches in your pocket and takes your money out, there better be a darn good reason why. So that's why I'm Republican. I think it's just recognizing, you know, the values of each party and, you know, really just focusing away from politics and what's important. My why is to do good things. And I say that because that was the first thing I said in the very first interview I did six years ago. And it was the cover of our local paper and it probably seems over, overly simplistic, but it has always been that. Just do good things. Um, our national rhetoric is so frayed at this point, but if we just focused on, you know, the five to 10 to maybe 20% that we all agree on, we could accomplish so much. My name is Joe Barella. I am currently the executive director of the Colorado Department of Labor Employment. I work for Governor Polis. I'm a Colorado native. I was born in Durango, Colorado. My parents are natives of Durango, Colorado. You know, I think growing up in Durango, I was very fortunate. It was, um, I would say, sheltered. Um, it was a very small rural community. Um, not a lot of diversity. In my mind, there was probably Hispanics, uh, which I am. I consider myself a native Hispanic. Um, white folks, and then maybe a sprinkling of diversity in the community. Never felt different. Um, I think the only experience I have growing up is I had both sets of grandparents in Durango as well, um, fluent in Spanish, but never spoke Spanish when we were around as kids. And you know, later on in life, um, I was very aware that they did that because they thought it was giving us an advantage to assimilate or integrate and be more successful um, not only in Durango but in the United States. Regardless if you're native born or you're a migrant coming into the United States, you have a beginning point um, of where you started. Any of us um, that are native have a time when in our lineage we were new Americans. And so I think growing up not, I would never blame my grandparents or my parents to say, I wish you would have taught me Spanish, because they were doing what they thought was right at the time to help me live a better life. And <clears throat> I can't uh, disagree with them. Um, I regret that I'm not a fluent Spanish speaker, but I have done very well in passion and purpose of what I want to do and be successful in Colorado. There's a connection to people's well-being and what they do for a living and we need to make sure that everyone has an opportunity, maybe, maybe not to get to the same starting line, but to get to the finish line where we as government can help them be successful in their work endeavors. We're fortunate at the department, we actually are operators of the majority of the public workforce centers in Colorado. And so being able to go out and, and talk to not only staff in those centers, but customers that are using services that really try to help them learn English as a second language, access um, resume and application uh, referrals, uh, gets, helps them place them in jobs, and what we can do to be more relevant to everyone that comes into the public workforce center. So I think I'd like to keep a pulse on that. I think that keeps me grounded. You know, I have an opportunity to talk to people who are successful. I, I think about our youth apprenticeship programs where young people who were overlooked as they went through the education system and maybe didn't get a chance to or were never talked to about, what would you like to do? What are you passionate about? But get enrolled in a, an apprenticeship program uh, when they're a junior or sophomore in high school and really develop a passion for something. And then, you know, three or four years later, you find out that not only did they finish their apprenticeship program while they're in high school, they got an associate's degree and got hired by a company, and now they're buying a home because of the wages they earned, the skills they gained through that experience. And so I think those are the things that touch me when, you know, you give people 
the opportunity to explore things that maybe through their family life, their education experiences, never had the opportunity to be exposed to that. People need to have multiple pathways to be successful. That there's not only one way that people can live the American dream. That, and it's up to us to help create those pathways through lived experiences. Um, the work I did um, with the Markle Foundation in really creating the conversation of skills-based hiring, alternative methods that we need to break down that the BA is the only, is a gatekeeper for someone getting a good job. That we need employers and businesses to realize that people come with skill sets and we need to look at does that person's lived experience and skill set competencies qualify them for this job. Governor Polis always saw immigrants as part of all of Colorado being successful. And in 2019, his first year in the, as governor, um, created uh, through executive order the Office of New Americans. And since that time, uh, we've had legislation that has actually uh, made it permanent uh, at the Department of Labor and Employment as an office that really looks at immigrants and, and how we as state government in partnership with business and industry and communities, nonprofits, can help with their transition uh, to becoming productive Colorado residents. I think the Office of New Americans really positions Colorado to provide not assimilation but inclusion and opportunity for people who choose to call Colorado home. We all have a new American story in our family history. I think it's an ongoing story. I think we need to figure out uh, a national immigration policy that would help us with new Americans as they choose to call any community in Colorado home. The Office of New Americans is really working in Colorado to help people who choose to stay in Colorado when they're coming in from an, another country, access employment, access services that help them learn English, um, access um, community supports so that they can find and locate permanent housing. Uh, the Office of New Americans is really working to make sure that people who are choosing to call Denver, Durango, Lamar home can transition into employment with the skill sets and the competencies, the credentials they have from the countries they're coming from and not have to start at the bottom of the ladder. Um, we really want to make and take advantage of the talents and skills, competencies they have and put them to work in Colorado businesses and industries. We can offer legal assistance uh, through the Office of New Americans to help them with documentations that give them the opportunity and the right to work in Colorado and the United States. Uh, we want to make sure that the resources they need in this transition period of inclusion um, in Colorado um, are meeting their needs and that we're not wasting the opportunity and the time they have to reach self-sufficiency. What has the attention of citizens, the media right now, is the southern migration influx we've had over the last 15 months. But there are immigrants that have been here two weeks, two months, two years, 20 years, that still need access to opportunity to be successful. And so through the Department of Labor and all the programs that serve immigrants, we need to realize that, that not everyone has had the opportunity to access program services that could help them reach their full potential. And we're talking about everyone having opportunity to live the American dream, the Colorado dream. That it's not just for what's the flavor of the day or what's hitting the media cycle as far as Southern immigrants, but we have immigrants that are many years in Colorado that still need access to opportunities. Colorado creates an environment for workers to thrive, but we also have to have an environment where business and industry thrive. That you. You can't have one without the other. And so how do we create opportunities for all Coloradans, regardless if they're native born or they're migrants coming to choose Colorado to be their home? How do we create access points so that they can, through work, be successful and provide for themselves or their families? 
how do we take advantage and, and use the assets that migrants are to our advantage in this time of worker shortages? And so, you know, that's where I think there's commonality. It's like these are individuals who need to reach economic security if they choose to call Colorado home. And so how through the Department of Labor, our partners in business and industry, our partners with labor, our partners with the public workforce system, create opportunities for these people to reach their full potential. When they do well, we all do well. My definition of the American dream is that people have awareness and opportunity to thrive in their community of choice. So I think that's probably my answer to say, hey, why are you creating opportunities for people who, who aren't born here? Because we have people that were born here and, and have needs too. I said, we can do both. Um, they are both in demand and we just need to make sure that we create opportunities for them to be successful. It's not one or the other, it's everybody. We hope humanized stories of immigrants moved and inspired you. Turn that feeling into support for PBS 12. Your donation helps us share more stories celebrating Colorado's diverse community. Learn more at pbs12.org slash donate.